Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com. St. Louis Public Radio's The Gateway gives you the day's news first thing every weekday morning. From the ever-evolving relationship between St. Louis City and County to developments in the Missouri and Illinois state capitals and reports from our correspondents in Rolla and the Metro East. We put it all in a roughly 10-minute package with clarity and context. Download The Gateway wherever you get podcasts. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. The Attorney General's argument also became weaker today. He, he relied quite a bit on uh, CDC saying, you, don't need, you know, if you're vaccinated, you don't need to wear a mask. Well, CDC is changing their guidance today. When a statute is ambiguous, of course, you look for a precedent, which there is none because for this case. And in addition to that, you look for legislative intent. And it's p clear that the legislative intent behind the statute was to not adversely affect commerce. So this is something where individual municipalities could decide to just sort of opt out of enforcement. That could have a big impact. Uh, it could have a very big impact, but you're right about who would challenge something like this. You would have to be a person who's directly affected by the failure to enforce, and I can't imagine that would be easy to prove. I'm Sarah Funsky. Yesterday, both St. Louis City and County reinstated mask mandates for all indoor public spaces. With vaccination rates lagging and the Delta variant spreading, the metro area joined Los Angeles County and Savannah, Georgia in again making masks mandatory. But do they have the legal right to do that in Missouri? In June, Governor Mike Parson signed a bill into law that restricts local authorities' powers during a pandemic. And now political foes want to use House Bill 271 to block these new rules. Attorney General Eric Schmidt filed a lawsuit yesterday citing that new state law. What are his chances of success? We have three experts here today to discuss just that. Yes, it's our legal roundtable, and it couldn't be better timing. And so joining us today to dig into these questions and many more is Eric Banks. He's a former state prosecutor and city counselor, now in private practice at Banks Law LLC. Eric, welcome back. Good afternoon. And we're also joined today by Bill Freivogel. He's an attorney and a journalism professor at Southern Illinois University Carbondale. Bill, welcome. Hi. And last but not least, today we're joined by Susan McGraw. She's a professor at the St. Louis University School of Law and director of its Criminal Defense Legal Clinic. Susan, welcome back. Thank you, Sarah. So, Susan, let's start with you. It's another day and another legal battle between city and state. Does this brand new state law give Missouri Attorney General Eric Schmidt a good legal tool to stop these mask mandates? Well, Sarah, that's a great question, and it's something we were discussing before we came on the air because there is no specific mention of masks or quarantine uh, in this law at all. So to the extent that uh, people might be thinking, oh, there's a law limiting the use of masks in the Missouri um, legislature, in Missouri law, that's inaccurate. What there is is a law that talks about the county and city or other counties and cities' inability to place limits on access to public places during a pandemic health emergency. And we're going to be in this state emergency until August 31st. And what it says is that a county or city can't restrict access to certain places during a health emergency without giving notice or getting a report. But it's very unclear at this point 
as to whether that access means access with masks or as access without masks. Hmm. Bill, do you think the way this statute is written that masks could be part of what's covered by it, that they would have to follow the rules for a mask mandate? I think reading it carefully that masks are not covered. I think the city and the county, uh, the mayor and the, and the county executive will have strong arguments to make that this law does not apply to, uh, to their mask orders because it doesn't. It doesn't have anything to do with access. Uh, you can still go in. Uh, so I, I think that's, that's a strong argument. Their argument also, the, the, the Attorney General's argument also became weaker today. He, he relied quite a bit on uh, CDC saying, you, don't need, you know, if you're vaccinated, you don't need to wear a mask. Well, CDC is changing their guidance today. And yesterday uh, and previously, uh, Fauci had said that, you know, this CDC guidance had said you didn't have to have a mask if you were vaccinated, uh, didn't necessarily apply in a city like St. Louis or St. Louis County where you have a lot of cases. So surging cases, changing guidance from the CDC, it still could come down to this state law. This says that they may not directly or indirectly restrict access. In any world, could that be masks? How you're reading it, Eric? Well, I certainly agree with the professor. I'm sorry, I'm not being clear because there's two professors here. So I agree with both of the professors. In fact, I guess I'm the only lawyer on the panel who's not a professor. I feel underqualified. <laughs> but Or maybe overqualified. No, no, yes. no. But I do believe that the Attorney General has um, excessively reached on this one. When a statute is ambiguous, of course, you look for a precedent, which there is none because of this case. And in addition to that, you look for legislative intent. And it's p clear that the legislative intent behind the statute was to not adversely affect commerce. So anything that deals with closing a business, anything that deals with limiting the amount of patrons in a b business could be affected by the statute. But certainly it was not intended to prevent local authorities from requiring masks. It's interesting. Governor Mike Parson came out yesterday um, saying that this is wrong and that he doesn't appreciate these mask mandates in St. Louis. It seems like the legislature um, would maybe not approve of these new mask mandates in St. Louis City and County. But if so, they screwed up by not making that more, more plain in the statute. Right. I think the statute is clearly um, read in context, meant to prevent the closure of businesses. Mm -hmm. um, you know, cities and counties do have the authority to issue public health guidelines in situations just like this where a public health emergency is happening. Um, and I have to agree that it's an overreach to try to work masks into what is very clearly an access mandate. So here's another question I saw a lot of uh, non-lawyers asking on Twitter yesterday, but it was also raised by attorney Chuck Hatfield, who's a very good lawyer, recently won that Medicaid case. He says, why did the attorney general's office not ask for a temporary restraining order here? It seems like even if they've got a good case, it's going to take a while for them to get the answer they want on this. Eric, can you think of any reason why they wouldn't have done that? Well, perhaps because it is an incredibly difficult standard to justify a temporary restraining order followed by a preliminary injunction, followed by a permanent injunction. And because I believe that this is all about political posturing as opposed to winning lawsuits anyway, what difference does it make? And that would have been a high hurdle. They couldn't, it, it wouldn't have been easy to get this temporary restraining order. Why give the opponents the big win in the headline if, if this is about getting on Fox News? That's correct. So here's another question I saw people asking. Um, the attorney general is suing the leaders of both city and county and some other uh, officials that are working for these two different entities. And he filed this in St. Louis County Circuit Court. Jurisdictionally, people are saying, can he sue the mayor of St. Louis City in St. Louis County Court? Does anyone have any thoughts on this? I realize this could be getting into a real uh, can of worms here. Well, as a, as a general rule, if one entity sues another entity in the government, um, we'll generally see it filed in federal court. Um, I, I'm surprised to hear that. I'm a little uh, 
Yeah, I don't, I don't see jurisdiction, um, and that just kind of lends itself to what Eric was talking about, and this being more of a political statement than an actual effort to win by litigation. Hmm. So we've got this political battle happening now in the court. <laughs> it seems like a, a contradiction right there. But there's also some political battles that are already brewing on this that seem equally complicated. For example, the mayor of Wildwood says he's going to use his own executive action to prevent enforcement within the borders of that suburb, which is in St. Louis County. Bill, any thoughts on whether he can just do that? I don't. I really don't know if if he can do that. Um, uh, it's uh, it, it would be a complicated question if it really got down to some sort of case that was uh, filed in court. Uh, I think it's a bad idea for him to get get involved in it, but I really don't know if he's got the legal authority to do that. And it's hard to think who could challenge his legal authority, I'm, even if he did this. I mean, I'm just thinking of who could even be a litigant on this. Right, but this is like when um, Mayor Jones said, we're not going to, uh, and Kim Gardner, you know, we're not going to enforce marijuana possession laws in the city of St. Louis. I don't know if it's something the mayor sa can say, but it's certainly something that the prosecuting attorney of Wildwood could just n refuse to issue these charges, that prosecutorial discretion is very wide. Hmm. So this is something where individual municipalities could decide to just sort of opt out of enforcement. That could have a big impact. Uh, it could have a very big impact. But you're right about who would challenge something like this. You would have to be a person who's directly affected by the failure to enforce. And I can't imagine that would be easy to prove. Yeah, that seems like a complicated case. I suppose the mayor could order the prosecuting attorney to not enforce the law. The mayor could do that. Yes, I, I think he could. I've got a quote here from a spokesman for the city of St. Louis. Uh, this is Nick Dunn. He says, Missourians have sadly become accustomed to the attorney general using their tax dollars to further his own political ambitions at the expense of the public's health and well-being. We look forward to this frivolous lawsuit failing like so many of his others. That's a little <laughs> dig at Eric Schmidt there. I will say, though, Eric Schmidt has lost some high-profile lawsuits lately. That includes one seeking to overturn results of the presidential election. The U.S. Supreme Court not interested in that. Um, they also tried to take on Obamacare, did not have success in the Supreme Court for that. We got a question from a listener that feels on point here. Kimberly asks, why hasn't someone, especially an attorney, filed an ethics complaint against the state's attorney general for filing frivolous lawsuits? Eric, could that be a, a, something an attorney should do here? I don't believe so. The ethics panel is usually more concerned about um, trust fund violations, commingling, um, misappropriation, um, blown dates, missing a statute of limitations deadline, something of that nature. They're more concerned about those bread and butter issues as opposed to something, quite frankly, very esoteric should you um, be able to file an ethics complaint against an elected official because you disagree with the position. It does seem like that could open a real can of worms there. I mean, I think the critics are, you know, have a really good point that he has been involved in in these lawsuits that border on on frivolous. I mean, joining with Texas in that challenge to the election was a, it was ridiculous, and um, uh, so I I think that they have an argument to make, and there and there have been some. There have been some federal court actions where some of the private, I believe it's the private attorneys who were involved in, in some of those uh, Trump challenges uh, are facing a possibility of sanctions. So, uh, you know, it's not like entirely out of the realm of, of being disciplined. But I, I agree with Eric that, you know, you, you really don't want to be telling the attorney general he can't be, the, you know, he, he doesn't have broad discretion to file lawsuits to cheat thinks he can make an argument for. We heard from a listener on Twitter just now. Eric tweets, isn't it true that only the county slash city health department enforce public health orders anyway? Wildwood and other mayors saying they won't seems like pure virtue signaling. It's interesting. I'm thinking, like, would the St. Louis police go out and go after a business for not wearing a mask if the health department wasn't involved? It is kind of hard to think of, of that happening. Well, I, I can't possibly think that St. Louis City Police Department would have any resources 
to do something like that at this point. I mean, they're barely getting to the murders at correct. this point. But what about Wildwood? Their police may well have some time on their hands. So by ordering them to stand down on this, is the mayor virtual signaling or is he making a difference in how this will play out? <laughs> I don't else? think it's going to make a difference because I don't believe that there's going to be enforcement anywhere in the city or the county on this. I, I don't think that the... Um, the powers that be have the political will at this point to engage in this type of battle with the public. I agree. Yeah. We're talking today to our legal roundtable. That's Eric Banks of Banks Law LLC. We're also joined by Bill Freivogel of Southern Illinois University Carbondale and Susan McGraw, the director of the Criminal Defense Legal Clinic at St. Louis University School of Law. We need to take a quick break. Uh, we do want to remind you our phone lines are open. And so if you have a question that relates to the legal matters we're chewing over today, you can give us a call at 314-382-8255. That's 382-TALK. You can also send us a tweet at STL on air. When we come back, we'll discuss uh, the Missouri Supreme Court's ruling on Medicaid expansion. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com. Welcome back. Before we get back to our legal roundtable, I'd like to invite you to join me this Friday evening. I'll be on the patio just outside our studio in Grand Center, and I'll be there with the one-woman musical enigma that St. Louis musician Sina So Pro. Sina So Pro is Saria Conaway's solo project, and she'll join us for both conversation and a performance on Friday evening. She'll play bass, violin, and guitar live on stage, building up tracks from her latest album, Chill Hype, in real time drinks will be available for purchase. I hope to see you in Grand Center for St. Louis on the Air After Hours, an evening of music and conversation. That's this Friday at 7.30 p.m. in Grand Center. You'll need tickets, but they're easy to get, just $10. You can get all the information at stlpr.org slash events. And now back to our legal roundtable. We're joined today by Bill Freivogel. He's an attorney and a journalism professor at Southern Illinois University Carbondale. And we're also joined by Susan McGraw, a professor at the St. Louis University School of Law and director of its criminal defense legal clinic, and Eric Banks, a former state prosecutor and city counselor now in private practice at Banks Law LLC. So we were talking about the attorney general who's trying to stop the city and county's mask mandates. We've been talking about some law losses endured by his office in recent months. There's another one to add to this list that just came down in the last couple weeks, and that's a pretty decisive loss on uh, the expansion of Missouri's Medicaid program. Bill, what did the Supreme Court do here? Well, the Supreme Court said that the initiative that was passed by the voters expanding uh, Medicaid was, uh, was constitutional, overturned the lower court judge's uh, ruling that it was unconstitutional. Uh, uh, the Supreme Court said that it um, it was a per curiam decision, so it's in the name of the entire uh, entire court. There wasn't a specific judge who was named as having written it. So I think they, it's a stronger way of uh, expressing the, the view. Uh, they said that the the, initi the initiative had expanding Medicaid had not included any any kind of requirement for an appropriation. It couldn't have been on the ballot if it had required. Uh, you know, such uh, had such a requirement, and uh, that because it didn't have any requirement for an appropriation, it was uh, constitutional. So this was a pretty strong overturning of what had happened down in Cole County, and there it was Judge Beatum. He ruled on an issue the state didn't even raise, whether this ballot initiative was properly on the ballot. Does this Supreme Court ruling suggest that he was wrong to bring that issue up here? Yes, it does. And I would also like to say that no person likes to be told that they're wrong, even a judge. And um, while I'm sure that he is professional enough to accept this as cost of doing business, um, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, even as a judge, it is a very, very um, stern rebuke. Hmm. And um, judges are human beings. And like most human beings, there's a temptation to keep score. 
And for judges, the scorekeeping involves, in part, how many times you've been overruled. And I suspect that um, the good judge is in a small minority of Missouri judges who have been overruled, ruled, procurum by the Missouri Supreme Court. Interesting. So, Susan, this is something judges kind of keep track on. This is their one loss percentage <laughs> if, they, if they get an overruling like this? Absolutely. Um, one judge I know refers to it as having your homework graded. Interesting. Is this uh, a big F that came down from the Missouri <laughs> Supreme Court? I'm going to say this is an F. Wow. <laughs> okay, my question then. So this is an F. The Missouri Supreme Court comes in very strong. And yet, a spokeswoman for Governor Mike Parson said, quote, after today's court decision, and this was on the day of, the executive branch still lacks the necessary budget authority to implement this coverage <laughs> to the expanded population. We are looking at what options may be available to us to seek additional budget authority and also pursuing legal clarity. It sounds like you guys are seeing a lot of legal clarity here. Bill, is this a cop-out? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, there seems to be a lot of legal clarity. And, you know, on the on the budget, I mean, budget authority, I guess, is one thing. But as far as is there money there? I mean, that's been the crazy thing about this from the beginning. Uh, by expanding Medicaid, the state gets a billion dollars more. That's way more. That's like five years of whatever the state share might be of this expansion. Uh, you know, Joel Ferber, one of the lawyers in the case, uh, you know, made made that point. So it's not like um, the money isn't there. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out. I just I don't want to sound too cynical, but it's like, does the Missouri legislature have another move here where they're going to try to block this again? I mean, it's so frustrating. I mean, this is so, this is so ideological. And, and, you know, I think a lot of these <laughs> These Republican uh, uh, legislators, I mean, they should pay attention to the fact, I, I think I read a, a percentage that 75% of the people who would be covered in the expansion are white. Hmm. Uh, and a lot of their constituents would, would be affected. These are people who aren't making much money. They're, these are not freeloaders. Like they're you know. hardworking people who yes. live in maybe small town Missouri. Right. Well, I had dinner with an individual who's from a small town in outstate Missouri. And he said that the county's one hospital would not be able to exist if Medicaid expansion does not come into being in Missouri. I mean, that's just how um, strapped financially many of the rural hospitals are. And this and could they, save these hospitals, this, right. this ruling. Well, we've been talking about some recent losses by the state's attorney general. That, of course, is a Republican. He's, he's got his little dinging here. But let's talk about some big mistakes that have happened uh, by the St. Louis circuit attorney. The Post-Dispatch reported that in a murder case, the assistant prosecutor assigned to the case failed to show up for hearings in three consecutive months. The judge dismissed that case. And the newspaper notes that two other murders have also been dismissed after prosecutors just weren't ready to go despite months on end. Susan, I know you spend a lot of time practicing within this system, representing clients who go up against the St. Louis Circuit Attorney. Does this alarm you? Oh, absolutely it alarms me. As a person who lives in the city, it alarms me. Um, and I don't think we can say that the prosecutor assigned to the case has failed to show up. She was on maternity leave. She had no obligation to show up. And um, you know, it's it's not impossible that assigning cases to someone on leave was a ploy to gain more time. Hmm. Um, I think as people who live in St. Louis, we should be alarmed by this, but I think we should also be alarmed at the fact that there's an absence of senior uh, attorneys in that office that are experienced and equipped to try these high-level cases. Um, you can't just graduate from law school and try a murder case. It takes many years to develop the expertise and skill to do that, and those people are no longer present in the circuit attorney's office. I'm glad you brought up this maternity leave issue because, yeah, this was not the fault of the prosecutor who didn't show up. The Post-Dispatch has since reported that this, this prosecutor was assigned approximately 30 major felonies after going on maternity leave. And that, I think, maybe suggests what, what Susan 
suggested there that this was a stall tactic, just shove them on her plate. It obviously backfired here. Yeah, it did. And it's really disappointing. I mean, I, I was certainly one person who had lots of hopes for Kim Gardner. Uh, she still has three years. I uh, hope she can turn it around. I mean, I, uh, I think her... Uh, the, the thing is, you know, some the, these when 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 prisoners uh, end up, you know, being held in, in behind bars for months and months while these continuances go forward. I mean, these are the very people who, you know, she was she was talking about, uh, you know, paying more attention to what was what was happening to them. Uh, so it's really counter to her, you know, her her goals. I mean, I th- she's. I mean, we have to admit she's faced she's faced huge odds. Uh, you know, the, the she raised good points about police lying, you know, police officers who couldn't be trusted in court and ended up in a huge fight with the with the with the union. She took on the prosecution of uh, the former uh, governor and you know was subjected to more discovery of, uh, as a result of the work of the million dollar defense team than I think any prosecutor I've ever seen had to face, and of course now faces an ethics complaint that grows out of that. Uh, so she's had a lot to fight, but she has only herself, I think, to blame for, for the disorganization uh, of her office. Bill mentioned, um, just briefly mentioned there, that defendants um, are suffering because of this, that people are waiting for a long time for their day in court. And that's something where the district defender, Matthew Mahaffey, was on our show a couple weeks ago talking about this and the impact this has on the clients he represents. Susan, I'm curious if this has also been a problem for the clients represented by your legal clinic. Yeah, I think it's a problem for anybody who is unable to make bond, and we should mention, like Bill was saying, this is another failure of the circuit attorney, um, continuing to ask for cash bonds, uh, continuing to ask for people to remain incarcerated while their cases are pending, and then, uh, you know, after a year dismissing them and refiling them, that starts the clock for all these criminal, criminally charged people. Um, and that's problematic uh, for their families. It's really problematic, as we've seen, for the crime victims' families who are uh, expecting resolution of the cases, and it doesn't come, and it starts over. Um, yeah, I, th- I think that it is a really serious situation. Um, it's not just about Kim Gardner anymore. It's about the administration of justice. I want to go to the phone lines. Tom is calling from South St. Louis uh, with a question here. Tom, hi, you're on St. Louis on the air. Thank you. Um, Yeah, it's really hard for the, you know, non-lawyer layperson to tell what's going on with this uh, with this uh, event, uh, because, of course, the there is some racism in the opposition to Kim Gardner, and they would love to her opponents would love to uh, cast her as incompetent and appeal to that racist stereotype. And so my question is, is this standard practice for the judge to dismiss a case in this uh, situation? Or was it that, you know, there was a a, a mix-up at the prosecutor's office, and the judge used this as an opportunity to do a gotcha. Uh, Tom, thank you for that question. Um, Susan, I feel like you probably do the most practicing in criminal court. What, what What's your take on that? Well, the judge was under an obligation to dismiss a case where someone was being held where documents regarding their case were not turned over, where people failed to appear, um, I was a very big Kim Gardner supporter when she ran initially. Um, And I have been, like Bill, very disappointed in what's happened. You have to realize there's three murder cases where cases were dismissed. There have been dozens of cases at the lower level that should have been dismissed for failure of the circuit attorney to appear and prosecute the cases, and the judges and associate circuit court did not dismiss those cases over the objections of public defenders and private attorneys. 
This is a systemic issue. This is not someone trying to pick on Kim Gardner for isolated instances. Um, this really <laughs> runs the breadth of her office. Eric, I'm, I'm curious if you have a perspective on this. I'm a minister without portfolio when it comes to this issue. I am not authorized to speak on behalf of the circuit attorney or her office, but I would hazard a suspicion that the office, her being ahead of it, is very remorseful as a result of this unfortunate set of circumstances and the requisite corrective action will be taken so that nothing like this happens again. Are we worried, though, that turnover has maybe hit a point where it just kind of feeds on itself? We've all been in offices where people start to leave, and then it's like, shoot, I don't want to get stuck with this person's workload and this person's workload and this person's workload. I start to think about leaving even though I, I hadn't wanted to leave. Do you think they can still sort of turn this around here? I am optimistic that it can be turned around, yes. Susan, right. do you share that optimism at this point? Um, I'm hopeful. I wouldn't say I'm optimistic. Um, I'll give you an example. I was in court the other day with a young circuit attorney who didn't know even the most basic um, tasks, such as filling out paperwork. The judge asked me to assist her. I was very happy to do so. But I literally sat down and taught her how to do her job. And that demonstrates a great failing on behalf of the circuit attorney's office. And, you know, and it reaches other areas uh, um, beyond the, the, the maybe d dangerous accused people who were concerned about uh, being out on the streets. I mean, there, there are 20 police shooting cases in the city of St. Louis where her office has not made a final legal, legal determination. It's just in limbo. It, it, they're in limbo. And, uh, uh, you know, I think, I think her answer is, well, the police investigations weren't very good. I don't have enough uh, resources in terms of uh, people to evaluate them. But, I mean, tw that's, that's a lot of uh, police killings that have not been evaluated. And, and I mean, let's she was she was elected as a in the wake of Ferguson seven years ago, uh, and you know if she can't deal with that issue, uh, it's a it's it's a problem. So one last thing I want to discuss related to the circuit attorney's office before we take our break, and that has to do with a special prosecutor who was basically appointed to look into her. And this is the kind of thing where a lot of people who are not happy about what's happening with Kim Gardner's office, they still end up defending her because some of her opponents are just very hard to like in some ways. Uh, so there's a special prosecutor who was investigating her um, and ended up uh, bringing charges against William Tisby, the investigator in this case. Um, the, the special prosecutor, Gerald Carmody, has now gotten off the case after running up about $400,000 in legal bills, all sorts of battles in order to stay on the case. He's now stepped down. Someone else is going to have to start from scratch on this. There was a very heated exchange in this past month in court. Uh, this William Tisby, the investigator who faces criminal charges, he's being represented by a guy named Daniel Daly. And after court adjourned, Daniel Daly suggested to the former special prosecutor, Gerald Carmody, that they talk. The Missouri Independent they had a reporter there who witnessed this. Here's the quote from her story. Carmody at first refused, but then pointed his finger at Daly and said, your day will come. The attorney Daly asked if he was threatening him, and Carmody said that he meant Mr. Tisby's day in court will come. Now, this attorney Daly has now written the judge. He says it's clear that Carmody was declaring that he intends to take revenge upon me. He now fears for the safety of his staff and family. Did the uh, Gerald Carmody behave inappropriately by saying that to a fellow officer of the court? I think so. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I would fit in your category of people who while critical of, of these things about about Gardner, I mean, I have quite a bit of sympathy uh, when it comes to what she faced as a result of her uh, prosecution of the former governor. Um, and you know, I I mean, I guess I just feel like the the, the Carmody uh, uh, investigation went awfully far, you know, in, in seizing all of the their computers and 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 their investigation into the circuit attorney's office and. Um, so, yeah, I think Carm I think he was out of line in saying what he did. Eric, would you like to see the judge look into this, look into these remarks and, and possibly take action? I think that the comments were 
um, not civil. I don't think that they were decorous. I believe they were unfortunate, but I also believe that they're not actionable. Hmm. There is so much acceptable ambiguity in that statement. Your day will come. Okay, well, what does that mean? Uh, are we talking about karma here? Are we talking about judgment day? Are we, are we talking about I'm going to meet you outside in the alley? I mean, what is that supposed to mean? And while it was not the most professional thing to say, I don't believe it is worthy of a judge's review or an ethics commission. Susan, we always hear about how there's all these rules that govern lawyers, and you all have to have propriety that we as, say, journalists don't have to have. Is, is that something that's, that's starting to change a bit? Oh, it's, it's changed. I started practicing 30 years ago, and there has really been a change in the level of civility of attorneys towards each other. Um, there was a time when even the most serious criminal case we would try, we were at least cordial and polite to the other side. And that has really, in my experience, eroded um, since I started practicing law, and it's very disappointing. We're talking today to our legal roundtable. That's Susan McGraw of St. Louis University School of Law. We're also joined by Eric Banks of Banks Law, LLC, and Bill Freivogel of Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. We need to take a quick break, but coming up next, we'll talk about litigation with the Rams. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. Welcome back. You know, I promised I would talk about the Rams here, but uh, as our legal roundtable reconvenes after our break, I realized I have to touch on one other matter related to the lack of civility that we were talking about just before the break. And that's this. A longtime Clayton lawyer was found in criminal contempt for telling a judge... Well, he said, screw you, except he didn't say the word screw. The word he said is one that I am not permitted to say on these airwaves. Um, he's now been ordered to serve seven days in jail. Um, I'm curious, obviously no one on this panel would condone saying those words to a judge, but does seven days seem excessive here, Eric Banks? It doesn't seem excessive to me, and perhaps that seven days in jail should be followed by seven days in a mental institution because <laughs> any, ju any attorney who would say something like that to a judge needs to have her or his head examined. That is just asking for trouble. And it's um, God don't like ugly. I mean, you're not supposed to talk like that to anybody, especially but, not a judge. But, yeah, I, I, I agree with Eric. But, you know, outside in the court hall, if somebody walked through that same courthouse that had a jacket on that had that F word in it, like F the draft, which is a Cohen versus California, it happened. Hmm. Supreme somebody court wore said, this into a courthouse. Into a courthouse in Los Angeles. And Supreme Court said First Amendment protection. One man's uh, vulgarity is another man's lyric. Huh. So you can wear that shirt to a courthouse. I don't think you can wear that on an airplane. They will they will not let you take off. But yeah, courthouses but, believe in free speech. Uh, <laughs> and New York Times had an editorial this past Sunday saying that uh, protect the woman in New Jersey who wants to say F to the president. Hmm. Well, so there's some protections. You just can't say it to a judge. Let's all agree on that today. <laughs> yes. Right. And when you, uh, when you ask to become a lawyer, when you sit for the bar, you know there's rules that you have to follow because you're a lawyer. And one uh, of them is don't tell the judge to, to take a flying leap. That is correct, Sarah. <laughs> All right, let's go to the Rams here. Um, St. Louis has been suing the Rams for years now, and it's very complicated. There's a whole host of parties suing, and there's a whole host of people they're suing. Um, but last month, the judge said that they have shown sufficient evidence to seek financial records from the league, the Rams, and the franchise owners, who include Stan Kroenke. Now, these records would be used to go after punitive damages at trial, and that's anticipated to start in January in St. Louis. Eric, how big is this news? Well, it's huge, but it's not surprising. I saw it coming. Most lawyers saw it coming. Getting the financial records are one thing. That's one hurdle. The next hurdle is asking the judge to allow you to present the financial records. And of course, that can only be done in phase two after there's been a showing of um, regular non-punitive damages. Okay, so this does not mean they get to use these. They're just able to start doing their homework. That's right, but keep in mind that no multi-millionaire wants their financial records out there. 
Now, there'll probably be some type of protective order. It may be um, under seal and so on and so forth. We may never know what's in those records, but the mere fact that a multimillionaire is being told what he, I guess most of the F NFL owners are male, um, has to do, that is not something that they um, entertain lightly. So clearly a setback for the NFL parties. And yet, as I'm reading the coverage of this case, I'm seeing that um, this has not yet been considered for summary judgment purposes. It seems like in light of that, it's way too early to spike the football. This could still get dismissed before it goes to, to trial. Well, it is too early. But, you know, in, in granting this, I think the judge was looking at whether it was reasonable to think that uh, there would be clear and convincing evidence down the road. Uh, and uh, so I, I think it's an indication that summary judgment probably won't, won't happen. And it sure it would be an incentive, I think, for some of these owners who uh, now need to turn over, may need to turn over their uh, records to say, hey, let's settle this thing for a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about a lot of money on, on this because the, the evidence seems to be really clear that the Rams, the Kroenke and the Rams were uh, misleading people uh, when they bought the property out in L.A. and, and said, no, oh, we're not building a stadium. It is interesting <laughs> how much um, their public statements are now contradicted by what we know they were saying to each other privately. It makes me wonder just um, how much legal penalty there ends up being for lying to the public. Well, I don't think there's much penalty for lying to the public. Um, <laughs> Uh, some, some, not me, of course, but some would say lawyers do it all the time. But I agree with the spirit of Bill's statement. Um, this case will not be decided by means of a motion for summary judgment. It will be settled for a whole lot of money, or there will be a trial in January where a city ver jury is going to come back awarding the plaintiffs a whole lot of money. Mm -hmm. So there is no way that the um, defendants, the league and the various individual owners, are going to get out from under this without bringing their big checkbooks to the settlement conference. Hmm. So there could be some money here. Well, as a St. Louisan, it's hard not to root for that. Um, <laughs> let's talk about another case. This one um, is going on in federal court. In the past month, two former St. Louis cops were sentenced. The two had previously pled guilty to their role <laughs> in the beating of an undercover St. Louis police officer who was badly injured while um, working at a 2017 protest. Now, Officer Randy Hayes pled guilty to a felony count of deprivation of civil rights under the color of law. He admitted to striking his own colleague, not knowing it was his colleague, Luther Hall, with a baton and shoving him to the ground, even though he was not resisting arrest. Hayes has now been sentenced to 52 months in prison. That's how, even though he cooperated with prosecutors and testified against his fellow officers. I was kind of surprised by that sentence in light of the fact that he was there helping the prosecutors. 52 months feels like a lot. Bill is just a served here. <laughs> Well, I guess I think it was served, but it sure isn't much of an incentive to plead guilty. Uh, uh, <laughs> his, um, I guess, his girlfriend, uh, who uh, just has to spend a few weeks in uh, in jail, uh, in prison, um, uh, for having lied about the whole episode. And I, I should pause you here to say this is a fellow officer. She was a very new officer on the force, uh, Bailey Coletta. She pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI and a grand jury. Um, she's now going to do two weekends in jail. I think that's awfully light. I mean, uh, th I mean, isn't that the whole problem with a lot of these police accountability cases that th that fellow officers will lie on and to try to keep their uh, colleagues from having to suffer the consequences. And so, you know, just a couple of weekends, I don't know. I don't think so. Susan, you do a lot of practicing in criminal court. What do you think of these two sentences, 52 months and then two weekends in jail? Are either of these off base in, in your opinion? Well, you know, as a general rule, I don't like to see anybody going to prison because I, its utility is marginal. But... Um, I think that the assistant United States attorney, Kerry Costanton, who prosecuted these cases and is an extraordinarily uh, good prosecutor, um, knew that to give 
him a small sentence in light of the fact that he admitted striking a prosecutor would send uh, a bad sing uh, signal to people that they're not taking it seriously. Um, I think it would have damaged the credibility of the United States Attorney's Office to sell that case cheap, even though he uh, assisted in the prosecution. So I, I got to say I'm not that surprised. Mm -hmm. Eric, any thoughts on this one? I think, and I realize how um, esoteric and subjective the concept of justice is, but I believe that justice has been served on this one. Couldn't happen to a nicer guy. I want to talk about another civil rights case. This one actually was deadly. This has echoes to me of Breonna Taylor. Um, Don Clark Sr. was a 63-year-old disabled veteran. He was in bed when a police SWAT team busted through the door of his house in the city's Dutchtown neighborhood, and they opened fire. This is called a no-knock warrant. They are allowed to do that, um, but he died as a result of these actions. His family members are suing the city. And what's interesting to me is that police listed several arrests claiming that Don Clark Sr. had a criminal record, and that was part of their justification for doing this as a no-knock raid, as opposed to having to announce themselves first. Now his lawyers are saying his record, he doesn't have any convictions. He did not have a criminal record. Susan, is that a big problem for the city? Yeah, it's a big problem because if you arrest someone um, you better have a reason to prosecute them and convict them. And if you don't, well, that ought to count against the government, not against the person who is arrested. An arrest means nothing. People are arrested for things all the time, and charges don't go forward. And, you know, I'd like to believe they were mistaken in saying that he had convictions, I don't necessarily believe that. And I think an effort to dismirch the memory of a man who died in his own bed as a re result of police action is, is grossly unfair. Yeah, I mean, these no-knock um, raids are extremely troubling. It seems shocking that in a city like St. Louis, with the leadership that we have in this city, that these are still being executed by our police officers. Eric, do you have concerns about that? I do. I think that they should be eliminated except under the most severe and egregious circumstances, and this certainly was not one. Um, when I was a state prosecutor, one of the um, my colleagues used to say, you show me a body, I'll show you a lawsuit, whether it's a criminal lawsuit or, in this case, a civil lawsuit. And once again, the city is going to be paying lots and lots of money over the, um, as far as I'm concerned, criminal actions of a few bad police officers. So in our final couple of minutes today, I wanted to mention another thing. Let's just get everybody's blood boiling in our final couple minutes of the legal roundtable. The Missouri city of Parkville agreed to pay $195,000 to settle a Sunshine Law case. This was filed by St. Louis attorney Mark Pedroli, who's done really good work on trying to hold some of these um, government bodies accountable. This is reportedly one of the largest Sunshine Law payouts in state history. And Bill, I find myself thinking about the fact that we seem to say that just about every month at this point. Every month there's a new one that's coming in that's higher than the last. What's going on here? Well, uh, public officials are continuing to, to not really pay attention to the Sunshine Law. I hope, you know, I hope Tony Messenger is right in this. I think he wrote a column saying this is a wake-up call for, for um, should, be wa should be a wake-up call for public officials to pay attention to the Sunshine Law. But um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have a lot of confidence that it's going to work that way. You know, one of the other interesting things in, in Tony Messenger's column, he quoted Tom Sullivan, who's a, a gadfly around town, really good on fighting these issues. And he pins this somewhat on Eric Schmidt. He says you should be able to go to the attorney general's office and them to take the lead on forcing people to turn over records. That's not happening. So people are pursuing private litigation. Um, well, this, this person did that. You yeah. Know, went to the attorney general, the Schmidt's office. And, and, didn't and get, nothing wasn't came out getting of it. anywhere. And that's when he found, you know, Pedroli, I think, and, 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 and went to court. Yeah, I don't think the attorneys general have done have done a very good job of, uh, of holding um, people's officials uh, to, to the law. Uh, I mean, you know, what happened in this case happens in a lot where 
they tried to charge the, the municipality, uh, try, which is a suburb of Kansas City, tried to charge the person seeking the records for like the, uh, you know, the, the cost of you know, like thousands of dollars in, in pulling the records together. And so this is the same thing we seem to keep talking about every month, where they're making the same mistakes, trying to overcharge somebody. Every month we say, this should be a wake-up call. Is this finally the wake-up call we've been looking for? I guess you'll have to stay tuned till next month. <laughs> we'll reconvene our legal panel, and we'll see if somebody can top this verdict. So Bill Freivogel of Southern Illinois University Carbondale, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. And Susan McGraw of the St. Louis University School of Law, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And also Eric Banks of, of Banks Law LLC. This is Eric Banks' first time being able to join the Legal Roundtable in person after becoming one of our most valuable players during the pandemic. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. If you learned something new from today's episode, consider leaving us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the easiest way to help people discover our show. We appreciate it. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.